Exodus chapter 19 now, in verse number 7, the Bible says, And Moses came and called for the elders of the people, and laid before their faces all these words which the Lord commanded him. And all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord hath spoken, we will do. And Moses returned the words of the people unto the Lord. And the Lord said unto Moses, Lo, I come unto thee in a thick cloud, that the people may hear when I speak with thee, and believe thee forever. And Moses told the words of the people unto the Lord. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go unto the people, and sanctify them today and tomorrow, and let them wash their clothes, and be ready against the third day. For the third day the Lord will come down in the sight of all the people upon Mount Sinai. And thou shalt set bounds unto the people round about, saying, Take heed to yourselves that ye go not unto the into the mount, or touch the border of it. Whosoever toucheth the mount shall be surely put to death. There shall not an hand touch it, but he shall surely be stoned or shot through. Whether it be beast or man, it shall not live. When the trumpet soundeth long, then shall they shall come up to the mount. And Moses went down from the mount unto the people, and sanctified the people. And they washed their clothes, and he said unto the people, Be ready. Be ready against the third day. Come not at your wives. And it came to pass on the third day in the morning. There were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mount and the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud so that all the people that was in the camp trembled. And Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet God and they stood at the nether part of the mount. Let's pray. Lord, one more time we call upon you and God, we need you to do something tonight. Lord, I pray you'd help me to think aright, Lord, and think in the channel that you want me to think in. Pray, Lord, you might give the unction, Lord, the anointing. I pray you give the message. Pray, God, to give the liberty that's needed. Lord, I need liberty tonight. And, God, I pray that you might get done what you want done. Pray there wouldn't be anybody here tonight that would put up the barrier and say, Lord, you can't do anything for me. And, and I know what I want no more. Uh, God, I pray that you'd be able to do everything that you want to do for your people tonight. And I pray, Lord, that... Uh, God, this service would prove to be a very special, uh, a lasting service, Lord. The, uh, the results, whatever they may be, Lord, that they'd be lasting and may carry us all the way to the uh, soon coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. We pray and ask it in His name. Amen. In Exodus chapter number 19, you read one more time in your Bible, the day system. And you've got to, if you ever learn anything from this pastor, you've got to learn the day system in the Word of God is called a very sure word of prophecy. The exact words of the Bible in Second Peter chapter 1 are called a more sure word of prophecy. You say, well, more sure than what? Well, the antecedent of that has to do with God the Father speaking from heaven. You say, well, how can anything be more sure than that? Sometimes you sort of wonder, but you know, uh, the Father could speak from heaven and you'd say, if you heard him today, tomorrow morning you'd say, no, nah, I just wonder, did he really say that? Did I really hear his voice? Did I hear that exact? Did I get it right? And you begin to question the thing. But you know what the Lord did? He put her down in black and white. So about time you begin to question something, you can go back and say, there it is. About time, you know, the devil works over and say, I don't think the Lord's coming back. It's going to be a while. He'll be back, but it's going to be a long time. You can go back and there it is again. It doesn't change. And the day system of the Word of God sets up the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, this term here where the Bible says you're to be ready. Re be ready against the third day. Uh, that's what the Lord Jesus Christ said in Matthew chapter 24. You can count on the fact that you're dealing with a picture of the second advent. You can be sure that you are dealing with uh, that, that, uh, that pictures the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the day system set up has a time element involved as far as the soon return of the Lord Jesus. Uh, you and I understand the Lord's coming back soon, and this not game time. That's not somebody trying to put you on, not somebody trying to put you to sleep, make you feel good night so you sleep well tonight. It's just somebody dealing with the Word of God. And dealing with the Word of God, uh, he says here, you need to be ready. I mean, if I don't, don't get anything else, you better get down to the fact that the Lord's coming is nigh. You better get down to the fact that the Lord is soon to return uh, for His own. The rapture for you and I, time is running out, time is just about out. The church age is just about history, and you and I are just about out of here. And you and I need to make sure that if there's anything that needs touched on before the Lord Jesus Christ comes back, you've got to get it right. If there's something you have, something between you and your a neighbor, you want to make sure you get it right. There's something between your soul and the Savior, you've got to get it right. The Bible says, be ready against the third day. Before the Lord Jesus Christ comes back, you're going to have a lot of things that are not right, but you don't want to be caught up in the drift of the world. 
You want to make sure that you are looking in anticipation for the return of the Lord, and you want to want to make sure that you got it based on the Bible system, the day system set up in the Word of God. That you find in Matthew chapter 17, Luke chapter number 9, John chapter 2, John chapter number 4, uh, and Hosea chapter 6, Exodus chapter number 19. You want to make sure that your basis for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ is what you read in black and white, dealing with the uh, with the, the Bible, the written Word of God. You want to make sure that you know and are certain the coming of the Lord is at hand. A word from the wilderness is in view of that. You and I need to be ready to meet God. You and I need not just go on about our way, paying no attention to the Word of God. You and I need to be ready against that day. And sad to say, there are a whole lot of Christians there backslid on God. There's a whole lot of Christians, their heart just cold as a block of ice. There's a whole lot of Christians, they don't care whether they're ready or whether they're not ready. There are a whole lot of Christians, the world's got uh, their attention a whole lot more than the Word of God's got their attention. And the Bible says you're supposed to be ready. Be ready against the third day. Question is, are you? My question to you tonight is, are you? And here's, you know, sometimes out in the wilderness, in verse number 1, the Bible says there, they came into the wilderness of Sinai. You know, sometimes the Lord uh, out in the wilderness, He has a word for you. And I would say this word here is, uh, it's good work for you and I even today. Uh, one of these days you're going to be meeting the Lord. The Bible says they're going to meet with God. And you want to be sure that you are ready. Samaria's, you're to be ready in. For example... You're supposed to be somebody that's not disobedient, but rather obedient. In verse number 8, the Bible says there, All the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. Now, that's just pretty good. I don't know about you, but I find a whole lot of people, they don't even want to hear anything from God. They don't care uh, what the Word of God says. It's, you know, all the Lord has spoken, we will not do. That's kind of how it goes. We don't care what God said. I'm going to do what I want to do. All that I want to do, I will do what I want to do. I don't care what anybody else says. And that's about the last way that you want to... You be found when the Lord's back. You want to make sure you're ready and that you are controlled by the Word of God. It's the Word of God that instructs you and I and tells you yay and tells you nay, tells you stop and tells you to go. It's the Word of God to control you. And you need to be pliable in the potter's hand or he's liable to mar, mar the clay and uh, make you very, very soft and very, very pliable. If you're going to be somebody who's going to play hardball with the Lord, it's not going to work. And you want to be somebody who's obedient. You know, in the Word of God, as a youngster, the Bible says there to be obedient unto the parents. That will be Ephesians chapter 6 and verse number 1. And that's always good to learn obedience to your parents because somebody that's obedient to a parent will then uh, eventually become someone who is obedient uh, to the Heavenly Father. If an earthly father cannot tell you anything, an earthly father cannot... Uh, cause you to be obedient, uh, then ultimately and down the line, whenever time comes for you to be obedient to a heavenly father, you won't be obedient to him either. And you start off by obedience to your parents on this earth. Are you ready? And the Bible says here, be you ready against the third day, for the third day the Lord will come down the side of all the people upon Mount Sinai. You need to be obedient to your parents, you need to be obedient to the gospel. The gospel being, of course, uh, uh, being the gospel of the grace of God, and the gospel that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, buried and rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Uh, the gospel that deals with the blood atonement. Because if you don't uh, handle the right gospel, you won't believe the right gospel, and you won't obey the gospel in the sense of believing uh, in a blood atonement for salvation. I mean, the devil, he'll, brother, he'll, he'll throw you a curve, and you'll find yourself believing what the Bible calls another gospel. And the Bible says, which is not another. It just appears to be another. It is not another. And you'll find yourself biting on that thing. And that's the last thing in the world you want to do. You and I need to learn to be obedient to the Word of God. We need to be obedient uh, to our Heavenly Father. We need to be obedient to the book. And we need to be obedient to those that have rule over us. In the Bible, in Hebrews chapter 13, verse number 7, it says, Remember them that have the rule over you. In verse number 17, I believe it is, in the book of Hebrews there, same chapter, the Bible says, Them that have the rule over you, obey them that have the rule over you. And you know, whenever somebody has rule over you, it's always, uh, they're not going to hurt you. They're not out to hurt you. They, they really have your best interest at heart. Sometimes, you know, people have a hard time with that. and They think, you know, this is... It may not be what you want, and sometimes, you know, sometimes for your best interest, the best answer you can get is no. Sometimes the best thing can happen to you is for somebody to say, no, you are not going to do that, and you are not going to go there, and they do that for your best interest. 
uh, somebody has a rule over you, I don't care if it's a parent, I don't care who it might be, uh, whenever they, you know, say, give you some sort of a ne- negative ty- uh, type of an answer there, they're doing it because they have got you in mind, not because they just want to be argumentative, not because they want to be uh, somebody who... Uh, Maybe is always uh, trying looking for a, a feud or a fuss, but they do it because they have got your best interest it at mind in heart in their heart. Uh, example in the book of Colossians in Colossians chapter one, the Bible says that uh, He wants to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in His sight. You know, when somebody has a rule over you, they're concerned about your presentation. Maybe you have a testimony, a testimony clears to salvation. Maybe, it, you know, matches the Word of God, testimony, no problem there. But from the testimony of salvation, we go on to the presentation. And the presentation is still, I mean, it's something else, it's still another thing. Uh, but somebody is concerned about how you look when you are Presented, They want you presented holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. And yet sometimes people, they'll take uh, one that has a rule over them. They just don't care any, uh, anything about it. They're not going to pay attention to it. They're not going to listen to anybody. They just, nobody can tell them nothing. They're not going to listen to the Word of God. They're not going to listen to the spokesman of God. They're not going to listen to the messenger of God. As a matter of fact, they're going to be like Manasseh and some of that crowd back there, Zedekiah, where they misuse the prophets of God, the messengers of God. They mock the messengers of God, and sometimes you find people that are exactly that way. They won't take anything from the Word of God, nothing from the messenger of God. They just are a disobedient bunch of people, and you would not want to be that way when Jesus Christ comes back. When Jesus Christ comes back, you want to be ready against that day, and the Bible says in verse number 8, you want to be exactly like the children of Israel, and they said in verse number all the people answered together and said, all that the Lord has spoken... We will do. They didn't have no intention of being disobedient. They want to be obedient unto God. Are uh, you taking Acts chapter number 5? You have Peter. And Peter cried out in Acts chapter 5. They tried to uh, blame him for a little bit of everything. And all the troubles of Jerusalem, they tried to push the blame on him. And uh, they're going to try to stop him in his tracks and stop the witness of God. And Peter said, we ought to obey God rather than man. And I guess you and I sometimes we need to learn early on to obey an earthly father. In return, learn to obey a heavenly Father, ultimately. Uh, learn to obey and be obedient to the Word of God, and the messenger of God, and them that have the rule over you, and to the call of God upon our life. You and I need to be uh, obedient Christians, and the Bible says be ready against the third day. My question to you is, does the Word of God control you? Or uh, do you think you are in control of your own life? And the Word of God doesn't play, has have any factor, doesn't even come into play in your life. If you want to be ready, then the Word of God must be in the driver's seat, and the Word of God must have control. Now, not only that, if you're going to be ready against that day, and the Bible instructs you and I, and knowing the day system, we're right down now nearly to it, uh, then you and I, we're going to have to distance ourselves from the world. I say that because down in verse number 5, the Bible says, Now, therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. Uh, God wants you and I to be a uh, distinct people, a very distinct people. As a matter of fact, in the Bible, in Second Corinthians chapter 6, the Bible says, You are to come out from among them and be separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. God expects you and I to be a holy people, a peculiar people. And uh, in the Bible, says, here in verse number 5, it says, I want you to be a peculiar treasure above all the people on the face of this earth. Now, listen, my friend, you certainly don't want to go drifting along with this world. You want to make sure that you are extremely distinct from this world. Used to be many years ago, the world, even lost people, had morals. Now you're doing good if you can, if saved people even have morals. I mean, we have gone, we have gone so far the wrong way. We have bottomed out so bad that you and I live in a day and time which saved people have no standards. They have no morals. I mean, they just have picked up with the world and they're just like the world. There's no distinction whatsoever. And God says, I want you to be peculiar. He said, I want you to be a peculiar treasure, not a peculiar joker or something off the wall. He wants you to be a peculiar treasure unto him and he wants you to distance from the world. The Bible says you're to be a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Well, let me ask you that. Are you looking for an opportunity to do something for somebody? 
Are you looking for an opportunity to get in there if somebody needs some help and give them some help? Are you looking for the opportunity for a deed of kindness? Uh, are you looking for a chance to help somebody out, especially they of the household of faith? Let us do good unto all men, but especially unto those that are the household of faith. And God wants you to be a peculiar treasure unto Him. He wants you to be far separated from the world. He wants you to be night and day. I mean, the world's over here. He wants you over here. He wants you absolutely distinct from the world. He don't want you even to look like Him, smell like Him, act like Him. He don't want you to pick up on their morals, not their standards, nothing at all. He wants you distinct and separate, and He wants you not only just distinct and separate, but he wants you to be that rare bird, and he wants you to be a treasure, or special. You take the treasures you have in your house, most of them are not cheap. Whenever we consider something to be a treasure, it's something that's very uncommon. It'll be something very rare. It'll be something you couldn't, I mean, money just couldn't even touch something, a treasure like that. And God says, I want you to be a peculiar treasure unto me. I don't want you to just cheapen yourself. I don't want you to be just common run of the mill. I want you to be above that. And uh, right before the second coming of Jesus Christ, you need to be ready against that day. And you need to distance yourself from the world. And you need to keep the covenant of God. You need to not let up as far as the word of God. Not let up as far as doing right. Uh, never let up and say, oh, you know, I'll just give up and let George do the job. Never do that. Uh, you be zealous of good works. You know, I think of the Lord and how that uh, the Lord out there, He's got it all. He owns everything out there. And yet He says to Israel, He says, you're special unto me. Now, you wouldn't think He'd talk that way. And uh, the earth is His and the fullness thereof. And uh, that being true, yet the Lord still desires you and desires me to be special and peculiar and not just special and peculiar, but he desires for you and I to be a peculiar treasure unto him. And uh, I think, you know, sometimes I've gone around these uh, golf shows and I've seen these guys out there. And I say, oh, wow, man, tell me about that. And they'll tell me something, you know, here's a club that's never been hit. And I said, never been hit. How old is it? Fifty years old. Never been hit. Boy, that is really something. And then they'll have beside and say, what's that thing? Worth? Well, well, they'll just have beside that NFS. You know why? Because maybe all the collection here, this is, you know, worth $50, this is $100, $200, $75, and yet there's something there that's a treasure to them. There's something there that's NFS. I mean, something there not for sale. A very peculiar, very special treasure unto them. I've got some things like that. I've got something over there, a friend of mine. Uh, that I played golf with, probably one of the best guys that I ever played golf with. Uh, he was an uh, actual, really sure enough pro, and I mean, it's just unbelievable to watch a fellow play. And one time I had a set of clubs, and there's only a hundred of them ever made. I don't know how I come across them, but somehow I didn't. And uh, he liked them clubs. He said, I'm going to have them clubs. I'm going to own those clubs. And I said, uh, no, you're not going to own these clubs. And my friend Jack called out to the company in California and said, no, it says we only made a hundred sets of them, and we're not making any more. And he just thought, boy, they were, they were just, I mean, they really looked like class, absolute class. And uh, as he got sicker, he kept on, you know, wanting those clubs. And he said, put a high price on them and I'll buy them. And uh, you know me, I'm, I don't know how to sell anything. And, and uh, so he just kept on and kept on. And finally I thought, you know, I'm not doing anything. Uh, these things are so special, you know, a hacker like me, I'm not even going to hit them. I'm just looking at these things. And here's my friend, you know, and his days are numbered. And, and these clubs, he ought, he ought to have these clubs. And I talked myself into, you know, kind of breaking that shell of selfishness a little bit. And uh, I said, uh, you say you want these clubs? And he said, yeah. I said, uh, and he gave me a high number. And I said, you got them. You're the proud owner of them. They're yours. <laughs> and I gave them to him. And he hit them clubs. He hit them a couple, three days. And, you know, guys like that, I mean, if it's just not real precise, he had them, he had them lengthened, I think, nine sixteenths. I mean, he just felt as though nine sixteenths is it, and he took them over to Ophers, and he lengthened the clubs, and he hit them again, hit them two or three days, and put them in the basement. And time came, you know, and he'd call for me, and I'd go over and talk to him, and, and I remember the, one of the last uh, times I was over there, we stood out in the porch there, and I said, Buzz, you've got to get right with the Lord. You've got to make sure that you're ready for eternity, and you've got to call on the Lord. He said, oh, I do, I do, I, I, right now I do, I'm, I, you know, like that, and he just, you know, he was, he was wanting to get it right. And, uh, you know, after he passed on about a month later, I got a call from his wife. And Mabel says, hey, Art says, uh, you're a driver over there. I can't hardly get in that driveway. It drives me crazy even trying to get in it. And uh, Buzz left you some clubs over here. Would you come get them? And uh, I said, I'll be over tomorrow. I felt like I wanted to run right through the backyard and jump the fence, you know, and run right over, you know, cross number 12 green and right in his backyard. And, and uh, But I was, you know, playing it cool. And I said, I'll be over in the morning. <laughs> and believe me, you know, I didn't sleep very well that night. And I wonder what he's got, you know. <laughs> and I went over that, that day and said, uh, 
Buzz told me that whenever he was gone to make sure that I gave these clubs back to you. And I said, Buzz paid me really well for those clubs. And she says, well, he told me to do it, and I don't mind doing it. Buzz really liked it, really enjoyed it when you came around, and I just don't mind doing it. And I, don't, I didn't mind taking them either. And you know those things, they're just down there, they got covers on them down there, I get them out, but I hit mine this year. And I look at them and I just, you know what those clubs are? NFS. You know what those clubs are? They're not for sale. You know why? Because they're peculiar. Only a hundred sets will say that. You know, uh, that's sort of peculiar, but they're peculiar and that my friend left those for me and gave them to me. Gave them back to me. And those clubs are not for sale. You say, well, then, you know, I mean, you got a whole... That's right. I don't really need them to play golf. I got more clubs there than I got. I'd have to grow about a thousand arms. You know? Well, a hundred arms. I'd have to grow more arms than what I got. Fingers. I mean, I, and toes. I mean, uh, I, you know, I got more clubs over there than I could hit in, in a lifetime. And yet, there's a set there that's peculiar. And they're a peculiar treasure unto me because of the background connected with them. You know what the Lord wants? The Lord wants you and I to be the same way. Not for sale. I don't care what the world offers me. Not for sale. I want to be a peculiar treasure to the Lord. When the Lord Jesus Christ comes back, I'm about you. You got to be somebody sold out. You ever read that story of Esau? He was a salesman. He was a salesman deluxe. You ever read that story in Genesis chapter 25? Here's a fellow that, I mean, he felt like, you know, it's about all over. I'm about out of here. And so he sold his birthright. And he despised it. And he despised what he did. As a matter of fact, he sold out very cheaply. He despised what he did and he wept. And he thought, God, no, I mean, Lord, there's got to be something can be done. No. It's gone. It's gone. And the Bible says he hated his brother. And he despised his birthright. Very pitiful, very sorry picture there. You know what God wants you and I to do? God wants you and I to be careful that we don't sell out. You want to make sure you don't sell the Lord down the river. You want to make sure that you, at the second coming of Jesus Christ, you are a peculiar treasure unto Him. And the Bible says be ready against that day. Are you? Say, well, I'm saved. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll take that. But what about the area of the Word of God controlling you? And what about in the area of you being distanced from this world? Is there anything peculiar about you? Your friends know that you are a born-again child of God. Can this world tell the distinction between you and anything else that's out there? Is there something unique about you? Are you someone says, I, I mean, a good name's rather be chosen than great riches and loving favor rather than silver and gold. And I'm not for sale. I'm not going to sell my name out. I'll not sell out the name of Jesus Christ. I'll not sell out my name. I'll not sell out my husband's name. I'll not sell out. Not for sale. NFS, not for sale. A peculiar treasure. Distanced from the world. Are you? He said, I'm going to meet with you. He said, Moses, get them ready. He said, Moses, you count on the third day. He says, I'll, I'm going to be coming down the side of all the people. And he says, I'm going to meet with them. They're going to be meeting with God. I mean, the time is running out. And Moses, get ready. And they got to be distanced from the world. You know, I said to myself, that's a pretty amazing thing. Somebody said, I'm saved. And they think that's all there is to it. And that's the major thing. And that's the important thing. That'll get you to heaven. That'll get you to glory. But, you know, I want you to be, I, I've got to give account for your soul. I've got to wash over you and watch, well, you know, I've, I've got to be like a parent. I've got to be careful of this cro congregation, this church family God's given me to pastor. And I want you, my friend, I'm concerned about your presentation. And I know that you, if you're going to be presented right, you're going to be ready. I know you've got to be distanced from the world. And the Bible says there in verse number 6, And you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. I'll just put it this way, that the priest is a go-between, between you and the Lord. The fallacy of the Roman Catholic Church is, uh, the great high priest we have now would be the Lord Jesus Christ. And in 1 Peter chapter 2, the Bible speaks about you and I as individuals. The uh, Bible speaks about us as having a priesthood. You don't have to go down to some temple. You don't have to go to some 
priest for a go-between, to be a mediator to, between you and the Lord. Uh, you have a mediator, you have a go-between. He is the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible says that uh, when the Lord Jesus Christ hung on the cross of Calvary, the veil in the temple that shielded the holiest of all was rent from the top to the bottom, showing you that God split that thing and God opened the way so that the way into the holiest is now open to anybody and everybody and you don't have to go to a priest that's going to go in there and offer for your sins. You go in there yourself and you go in as individual priest and you go in before God and say, God, I've got nothing to offer in these hands. There's nothing to offer. I mean, I have but one thing and it is an act of faith in the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, what you have to do as a kingdom of priests, uh, an individual priest that can go to the Lord, God still wants you to go in there as somebody who is snow white and holy. And the Bible says there that you're to be uh, not just a kingdom of priests, but the Bible says an holy nation. God wants you and I to be white. God wants you and I to go with our worship and go before the Lord. He wants you and I to be holy. In the Bible, in 1 Peter chapter 1, the Bible says you're to be holy in all manner of conversation. Everywhere you go, and if you're not careful, it'll, it'll creep up on you and something will come out that you said, Oh, no, man, why did it say that? Maybe it'll be a form of Christian custom. Maybe it'll be something just kind of sneak up on you. you got to be real careful all the time. The Bible says in all manner of conversation. If you're not careful, I mean, the way you say something, you say something correct, but say it with the wrong attitude or the wrong angle, and there are going to be problems. You and I need to pray about it. You and I need to be a holy people watching every word that we say. No corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. You and I need to watch our conversation, everything we say, every word that drops out of our mouth. You and I need to be in control of things at all times, and your conversation needs to be holy and godly conversation. You do well, my friend, to talk about the Word of God. You do well to saturate yourself with the Word of God. You do well to love the Lord Jesus Christ and to talk and to exalt and to brag about the Lord Jesus Christ. You do well, my friend. The Bible says you're to be a holy people, a holy kingdom of priests, a holy nation. And you and I likewise as individual priests, you and I need to be snow white. You and I need to be holy in the eyes of God and the eyes of your fellow man. You and I need to be careful with the words that drop out of our mouth. In First Peter chapter 1, the Bible says not on that, you and I are supposed to pass the time of our sojourning here in fear. You're not supposed to be somebody who says, I don't care what God says. I'm not afraid of God. Uh, my friend, you and I are to live realizing that, I mean, each breath could be your last breath. God could take you and take me and snuff our lives out like a candle. I mean, it only takes but a stroke of the hand of God in your history or I'm history. Uh, you and I need to live in fear of God. The Bible says, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. You and I need to realize that, brother, we're put together a way that doesn't take much to, I mean, put the brakes on us. Sometimes you read about people in the prime of life, 30, 40 years of age, and you think they'd have 40 uh, years to go. And yet, uh, all of a sudden, they come up with an illness where they have, at best, a 50-50 chance to survive or to make it. You and I, brother, we're the same, made out of the same stuff, same business. Uh, the Bible says that which is born of the flesh is flesh. And you and I need to live, brother, in fear. Not that we are uh, deathly afraid of the judgment or going to hell. But you and I realize that God could uh, put the brakes on you at a moment's notice. Uh, the Bible says also that you and I, we're supposed to uh, love the brethren. Brotherly love. And the Bible says uh, unfeigned love of the brethren. Uh, if you're going to be ready for the Lord Jesus Christ to come back, you're going to be clean in conversation. Uh, you're also going to have to be somebody that fears God. And you're going to have to be somebody that's not phony, a show, a fake, an imitation, a manipulator. You and I are going to have to make sure that, brother, what we say is exactly what we mean. It comes from our hearts. And nobody not trying to lead anybody uh, astray or put anybody on. Uh, you and I, it's unfeigned love of the brethren. I don't know about you, but I've seen enough hypocrisy in Christian circles last me the rest of my life. I don't need any more. The thing I enjoy is somebody like Brother Nathan Bemis, no guile. That's what's refreshing. That's what's a blessing. Uh, you and I... Uh, we are to be somebody, unfeigned love of the brethren, and it's not to be kind of a put-on type of thing. Let your love be without dissimulation. 
hypocrisy. See? Nothing phony about it. For real. You love the brothers. Uh, you appreciate the brothers. Uh, you do anything you can for the brothers. The brothers have done a whole lot for you. Uh, you enjoy being around the brothers. You enjoy fellowship with the brothers. Passing out tracts with the brothers. Going to praise with the brothers. Going street corner with the brothers. Going to church with the brothers. You enjoy the brothers. You love the brothers. And the Bible says unfeigned love of the brethren. Now, uh, you and I as well, we need to have a heart for them. And love them with a pure heart fervently. And our motives being pure. Uh, God would have us be that way. You and I, the Bible says, are a kingdom of priests. The Bible says you and I are supposed to be also an holy nation. God would have you be ready for His return. And He would have you be ready by being somebody that is controlled by the Word of God, is distanced from the world, and is white as snow when it comes to your worship, comes to your worship before God in heaven. We've kind of cut ourselves a whole lot of slack these days, going way too far. Uh, it's become so bad that... Uh, I'll give an example of how the day and age is in which we live. Over here in Alliance, there's a clothing store going out of business that I, matter of fact, about this suit there. I don't remember about the shirt. But I just enjoyed going to the fellow called Brandon's Clothing. It was nice stuff, not high, high price, but uh, good stuff. And I enjoyed going over there. But this month, is it's all done. His dad was in clothing business 50 years. He followed him up and the thing is closing down. And he said, times have changed. He says, not only have the, chain, the big chain stores pretty well done us in, with the store being closed in Louisville, one in Youngstown, one in Poland, wherever Poland is over in that area somewhere. And he named three or four places where clothing stores such as his have, have uh, closed down. But he says, times have changed. He says, used to be people would dress up for certain occasions. But he says, nowadays people don't even dress up for weddings anymore. And I thought to myself, I never thought of that. But you know, that's there's a lot of truth in that. And because times have changed and people are so loose anymore, they just really don't care anything about holy living. They say, well, clothing doesn't do it. I understand clothing doesn't do it. I'm just simply saying that uh, sometimes we take an approach uh, to the Word of God and to God, whereby we don't really care how we look in His eyes. We don't really care whether we are white as far as, you know, conversation, as far as our love for the brethren, as far as, you know, not being a phony or a put on. Sometimes we don't really care how we look, and yet God does. You and I, the Bible says, we are to be very a peculiar treasure. We're to be a kingdom of priests, and you and I are to be a holy people or a holy nation. You and I that are individual priests, you and I that are saved, we do not need a go between. We have the Lord Jesus Christ. We go straight to the throne of grace. And you and I need to be careful that holy people. Over by me, Mike says, I can do these windows over on Lake Crest. I looked for you, Dad. I couldn't find you. And uh, so I can do these windows on Lake Crest. And he says, over by that monastery. And he says, that thing gives me the creeps. Amen. And uh, it gives me the creeps worse than it gives you, brother. Because I just live down the road. And... Uh, in bygone days, my kids, about all the kids had paper routes. And, you know, Sunday morning, big old heavy papers, you'd take them up there. And a whole lot of the time, surely she'd take the car, you know, and, and take them on the route. And uh, there were a lot of times up there that you'd go up there and say, wow, look at that. And you see that big old down spot, you know, beside the garage door, and it'd be smashed flat. And uh, you'd see maybe the bricks inside the garage door, and they'd be knocked off. And uh, one time I seen them, uh, they had the neighbor's porch all propped up and, and uh, it had been hit. And I thought, now how could anybody ever hit that thing, man? Uh, uh, that doesn't even make sense. And uh, man, it was, you know, knocked apart and all propped up. And I come to find out that that place was a, it's a drying out spot for alcoholic priests. I wouldn't call that exactly a holy people, a peculiar treasure. But alcoholic priests, is, uh, that's what it was for. And uh, some of them guys, you know, it looked like as though it wasn't doing a very good job. <laughs> they apparently weren't getting too dried out. One time one of them guys come out of there and he was in his car and he went straight up over the hill there. And fortunately nobody coming on 44th Street. And he drove, never even turned, drove right straight across 44th into the yard. That's what happened to the porch. I mean, he plowed her under. And uh, nothing ever happened. Of course, they were living there because of a certain reason. And so they just sort of covered everything up. Uh, but those kind of things happen. Uh, those guys are anything but holy. 
uh, we used to see him walking up and down the street. And there was a, there was a unique fellow that, I don't know if he came from Canada, he was just unique in his appearance. And we'd see him walking down the, down past the house there. And one night, uh, I think it was on a Sunday night, got a telephone call and they wanted my son Jim. And Shirley had answered the phone and I saw her kind of look like I never heard this voice before. And she gave Jim the phone and Jim talked a little bit to him and he hung up. And Shirley said, who was that? And he says, well, I don't know. And she says, well, who'd it sound like? And here was his answer. Well, I'll tell you the truth, it sounded like the priest. It doesn't take a genius to put it together, does it? You know what you and I are to be? You and I are to be all the other end, of, all the way to the other end of the line. You and I are to be a holy people, a peculiar treasure to God, a holy people, unique distance from the world, and in our worship before God, you and I are to be as white as snow. Holy is God's word. That's what God would have you to be. That's what God would have me to be. Not only that, you and I are to be a people that are willing. In view of the Lord's soon return. And you cannot deny it without denying the Word of God. You can't scoff at it without scoffing at the Word of God. You would have to say the day system set up in the Word of God. He says be ready. And Jesus Christ said, Therefore be ye also ready. And for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. You know what God would have you and I before to be ready for His return? Not only saved, but surrendered and willing. In verse number 8, the people said, we'll do it. Whatever, God, we don't have any areas. We have nothing we're kept by. God, whatever you want, we'll do it. It doesn't really make any difference. It was as though, God, you name it. You call the shots. You tell me. You tell me what. You tell me where. God, you call the shots. I'll just do whatever you want. God, I have no stipulation. Whatever you want, I'll do it. I'll go wherever you want me to go. Wherever you say, Lord, I will go. I will do what you want. Willing and surrendered. Kind of a funny story that Tom told when he described his friend that just left, was here about a month ago and is in New Guinea now, who married the gal that when Tom had her as a crint, uh, said, what if someday your husband comes home and says, I'm called to the mission field? And her response was, she would just say, I'm not going. She's there. And she thinks she's going to be in hiding over there and never go outside the house. And Tom said, what if the Lord calls your husband back in the bushes with Wayne Fair? I wouldn't go. Oh, yeah? Is that right? You know what's so funny? The funny thing was to hear Tom be up here and watch Tom tell that story. I thought that was humorous, don't you? I think that's real funny. That's how the Lord works. And I watched all the ladies in the congregation just go. <laughs> and get real serious and get real sober. <laughs> that was funny. That was real funny. You know what? You know what God wants you to do? I don't care whether you're male or female. God wants you to be surrendered. God wants you to be willing. God, whatever. I don't have any stipulation. It doesn't matter. I know that your will is the best thing. Best thing can happen to me and it doesn't really matter where. God, whatever you want, I'm willing. God doesn't ask you to do something you can't do. But He does ask you to have a willing mind. It's according. Not that a man hath not, but what he hath. Not just in the area of this. Talent usefulness God knows where you could be used the best in the Bible the word in Romans chapter 6 is yield yield yourselves as servants unto righteousness why heretofore you were a servant of unrighteousness now just be yield as a, yielded as a servant of, unrighteous, of righteousness that's what God would have of you and I it's as, oh Lord, whatever you want, there's just no hesitation. Like, Lord, I'm not even going to second guess you. I'm not going to get uptight about it. God, you, it's up to you. It's entirely up to you. And in the passage there in verse number 8, right before he tells them to be ready, 
I would say not only be ready, but to be ready, you better be willing. You better be willing and you better be somebody that doesn't have any stipulations. When somebody is willing, you probably found this out like I have. They're willing and they have no stipulation. Whatever God wants is fine. Little, big, in between, fine. And I have noticed when someone is willing with no stipulation, God always seems to find something for him to do. He always does. I've noticed that. And here's what else I've noticed. I've noticed when somebody is willing to do just this, and they're willing within a frame. They've got stipulations. They're willing to a point. It seems like as though that God doesn't ever really do a lot with them. You know what you and I need to do? You and I need to be willing. You and I need to be surrendered. Totally. And God, it doesn't matter. Whatever. And God will find something for you to do. And He may, before it's all said and done, put more on you than you can do as long as you remain willing the bible says be ready a word from the wilderness is very basic isn't it be ready be ready against the third day you and i know the lord jesus christ he's coming back and i want you not just to be saved i want you not just washed in the blood but i want both inward and outward moses get them ready get them ready to meet me be ready against the third day they're going to meet god all right down in verse number 10, he says, tell them to go wash. In verse number 14, the Bible says, they washed. Those who went down from the mountain, the people, and sanctified the people, and they washed their clothes. And, you know, it doesn't hurt you to be clean outwardly. You say, well, you know, God looks on the heart, true. And you've got to be washed in the blood of Jesus Christ as far as your sins, but it really doesn't hurt you to be outwardly clean. The Bible says uh, that you and I are no manner of uncleanness, which should we be known for, but rather holiness. That would be the idea. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 7, they washed their robes, made them white in the blood of the Lamb. And you and I that are washed from our sins in His precious blood, you and I that have the conscience been washed in the blood of Jesus Christ, and the guilt is gone, you got a perfect conscience before God. You and I that are washed, you and I need to be very careful that you don't just say, I'm clean on the inside, but as well, it doesn't hurt you to be clean on the outside. It doesn't hurt you to have everything in order. The outward show of what this world sees doesn't hurt at all. He said, tell them to go wash their clothes. And verse number 14 says, they did it. They did it. And I don't know about you, but it seems like as though there's something about washing and being clean that's better than me medicine, vitamins, herbs, body balance, whatever Martha has. Don, whatever you come up with. Don's always telling me, well, herbs were here before the chemicals. <laughs> Well, maybe you're right. I guess maybe I better try some herbs before I take too many pills. But uh, you know what God have you and I do? Have you and I to be washed. Be washed clean. But it seems as though that sometimes those kind of things are passed by. We say, I'm clean inside. Good. You're saved. You're washed in the blood. Good. But you know how it was as far as the tabernacle... They were to go in there and they were to wash at that laver. They were to wash their hands and their feet thereat. I think it's the term in Exodus chapter 30. And they were to go in there and they were to wash. As they approached the holiest of all, they were to wash. And it would be good for you and I to wash. Though you're saved, it would do you good to Keep it spotless outwardly also. That wouldn't hurt a thing. Then the Bible says about that husband that uh, he's to sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. 
And God wants you and I to be washed clean by the Word of God. If you're going to be ready, you have to make sure that you are washed outwardly and especially inwardly. But it wouldn't hurt you even as far as outwardly. That would do you some good. You know, sometimes you ever get feeling grubby? Sometimes I get up and I think, no, I'm not going to take a shower. I'm going to do this first. And then I do that and say, well, I'm going to do this too. Well, I've got these, you know, clothes before I get my shower. I'm going to do this too. And then 11 o'clock turns into 12 o'clock and you say, well, you know, I'm going to do this too. I'm going to go out to church and do this. And, and then I'm going to... And then 12 o'clock turns into 2 o'clock. And you go like that and say, man, I feel grubby. You feel terrible. And have you ever noticed when you feel like that, you get a shower? And man, it just seemed like as though that all of a sudden, it's just like, it's better than medicine. You know, a cup of coffee, sometimes it kind of cranks you a little bit. But sometimes even coffee don't do it. And it seemed like as though that washing is just a miracle. And the vitamins, that nice, that it turns you red, but it don't do it. Just get you flushed. And seem like no matter what you give a shot at, it just doesn't really do the job. I mean, you say, you want breakfast? Yes, I want breakfast. You know I want breakfast. Uh, matter of fact, I want a plantation breakfast. You know what plantation breakfast is? Well, they get them to you down in Virginia, old Virginia. And it's one of these things where... We'll gladly sell it to you, but you don't know really what you're buying. It's one of these things, ham and eggs and taters, and man, I'm telling you what, about a 10-course breakfast called a plantation breakfast. costs you about 8 or 10 bucks, but man, I'll tell you what, it is, it is something else. And you know, sometimes you'll say, you know, you're, well, of course I want breakfast. Of course I want a good breakfast. Of course, I want a real good start. Of course, I want, you know, I want ham, I want ham and eggs. I don't want bacon, I want ham. I want sausage. Uh, you know, sometimes you get that way, and then you get done, you still don't feel like you, it ain't there. It just ain't there. And after the coffee and the plantation breakfast and the vitamins, and you, they're just, you know, now what do I do? Go wash. <laughs> Go wash in the pool of Siloam. <laughs> Go what? Go dip yourself seven times. Well, you know, go on and give it a try. It works. There's something about being washed, even outwardly. Well, now you might have to rinse off in cold water. I forgot to tell you the trick. Get yourself all washed up, and then, before you're done, turn off the hot, off, totally off, all cold. And that'll, that'll get it going. <laughs> And you get done, boy, you'd be up there, man, you'll just have your hair combed, you'll just be, man, you'll feel like as oh, man, what do you want done next? I mean, I'm, I'm, let's go, let's go for it today, man, let's, let's go. But you got to wash. And the same thing is true spiritually. It doesn't hurt you a bit to be outwardly clean as well as inwardly. Last of all, let me say this, if you're going to be ready for that third day, and that third day identifies the second coming. And you know it does as well as I do. Matthew chapter 24. Jesus said be ready. Same thing as this here. Uh, you can be sure. Right of the second coming. Mount Sinai. You know where he lands. And comes up the king's highway. Crosses over. Beth Abra beyond Jordan. Comes on in the eastern gate there. You know about that. But you got to be ready. Last of all let me say this. You better watch the boundaries. In verse number 12 the Bible says there. Thou shalt set bounds unto the people round about. In verse number 23, Moses said unto the Lord, The people cannot come up to the mount, to Mount Sinai, for thou chargest us, saying, Set bounds about the mountain, sanctify it. You know, God sets boundaries. And this business about changing boundaries doesn't help a thing. It always creates problems. I'm old enough to tell you that it creates problems in your town. Like it or lump it. I've probably been around here longer than you have. 
The Bible says that God hath... Well, the Bible says, amongst other things, set the bounds of their habitation. You know how God, God sets bounds so that a certain type of people, it's easier for them to get saved under a certain setup. He'd done it for their good. You know what the world does? The world just, they try to, you know, blanket the boundaries. Do you ever have somebody incessantly cover up a, a line pen that's been a surveyor's pen? And you go dig out around it, next thing you know it's covered over and flowers planted? And you say, now what is going on? And you don't really appreciate it. You know how the Lord feels about that? The Bible says uh, that He pours out His wrath on them that remove the bounds. That will be Hosea chapter 5 verse number 10. God sets certain bounds. You remove the boundaries and God says you're going to pay for it. This case here, they say no boundaries. We don't care. We're, we like it. We're going to go to the mountaintop. We're going to... Oh, are you? Uh-huh. You ain't going to make it. You're not going to make it. And God sets bounds. You better make sure you hold to those bounds. You take around this property here. I've been trying to buy some extra property. I don't know where we get it or not. Probably not. But we give it a try. Stop and see the farmer man again. But right now, that cornfield's out of bounds. And all the kids know it's out of bounds. All the teens know it's out of bounds. Everybody in this church knows it's out of bounds. That's not our property. And you're not to go in that cornfield. You go in there and tramp down corn, the farmer's not going to appreciate it at all. It's out of bounds. Well, I don't care. Okay? You cross the bounds and see what happens. There was a fellow in the paper this last week, and he was, uh, he was just picking up tomatoes. That He said he only picked one off, and they were throwing them at each other. The, and uh, he got him a slug somewhere. It used to be... Uh, I think it's 15. Number 15, Tam O'Shanter. When I used to caddy out there as a little fella, there's a cornfield there. And you know how the hackers do? They all got this banana ball. A banana ball is one of these things go like this. Wow! Right over the fence and out of bounds in the cornfield. And you could go over there on a Sunday evening and you could just go in there with the, the old dungarees, you know, the pockets like this. You'd go in there and you could just load up your pockets with golf balls. Except, the farmer said, you cross that fence and you're going to get some lead somewhere and he meant it but you know sometimes on occasion somebody would say well you know I'll just take chance that's crazy uh, that's like the Lord so I set some bounds don't cross them bounds and the same thing's true how people are there that, kind of that way they feel like as though oh I can just you know I'll do what I want to do if I want to stay in bounds okay I, out of bounds I'll just do what I want to do Jeremy was racing Josiah and Elizabeth. Was Elizabeth in that race? After canvassing the other night? And here they go. They're coming down to the finish line. You know, man, they're trucking away like that. And uh, Josiah almost beat them all. But Jeremy took one last leap. Off the blacktop he goes. Into the grass he goes. In the cornfield he goes. OB. Right? What happened? Get up, Jeremy. Get up. Well, he's trying to. He's going to make it. But he got up. Oh, my leg. Oh, my ankle. Oh, I twisted my ankle, man. I took one step in that cornfield. Man, I don't know what I hit. Man, I, I hit a rock. I hit a hole. I hit something on my ankle. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah. God set some boundaries. And young person, don't try and go outside those bounds. It ain't going to work. It doesn't matter what the world says. It don't work. Wayne Munn had a son one time about 14 years of age. 12, 14, 10, 12, I don't know. Those people down there, they're so big. You'll see Wayne Munn next Sunday night. Probably about 6'5". Uh, those guys got people down there. And uh, Wayne's son was getting under conviction about getting saved. And I remember we went down Carrollton. We was coming back and... Andrew says to his dad, he says, uh, I might not go to church tonight, Dad. What if I don't go to church tonight? He was under conviction. Knew he needed to get saved. Lord was dealing with him. He said, well, son, I'll tell you what. 
you need to realize that you can't get outside of God. You know, a lot of people are. They're full enough to think, I do what I want to do. No, you can't get outside of God. And I'll tell you something else. You can't get outside of the bounds that God has set up without paying a steep and heavy price for it. And anybody that tries is a fool. My question is, are you ready? He said, Moses, get them ready. And I'm trying to get you ready. I want you not only to be washed in the blood and saved, but I want you to be controlled by the Word of God. I want you to be distanced from the world. I want your worship to be white and holy. I want you to be willing and surrendered. I want you to be washed outwardly, not just inwardly. And I want you to be very careful that you watch the boundaries that God has set up in His Word. I've got to watch for your souls. I'm concerned about your presentation. And I want to ask you to check the list. Christian, check it out. Are you ready? You ever think of the group in Matthew chapter 25? There are ten virgins. Five were wise and five were foolish. Midnight the cry goes out, the bridegroom cometh. Oh, where's our oil? Too late. Too late. Very sad. Only five of ten were ready. In Matthew chapter 24, you have a fellow, his idea was the idea of the world. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Because my Lord delayeth his coming. Set it down in his heart. Nobody knows how I feel, but that's how I feel. Eat, drink, and be merry. Oh, you read the result? 48, 49. Oh, no, 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 no. Pitiful thing, Matthew chapter 23. He said, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, I beg you, I beg you. Man, I have tried to do everything I can do for you. Jerusalem, you just, oh, Lord, you, man, you've blown it. Your house is left unto you desolate. Weren't ready. Matthew chapter 22, just as pitiful. Got a wedding supper. It's all ready. Bid him to come. Oh, the one consent begin. Oh, go ahead, sure, make excuse. Pitiful. Oh, pitiful. Matthew chapter 21. Go! I go, sir, and went not. Oh, not ready. It's pitiful, isn't it? Matthew chapter 20. Same picture. Lord said, God of vineyard wants you to go to work. Get out there. I'm going to pay you. I'll pay you well. 11th hour of the day. I'll, I'll pay you. I'll give as much as I gave him. I mean, those are born in the burden the heat of the day. 11th hour. Go do it! And the Bible says they were standing idle. 11th hour, and they were idle. They were not ready. Pitiful. Chapter 25, 24, 23, 22, 21, 20. Pitiful. And Christian friend, please, let's take check and let's be controlled by the Word of God. Let's distance ourselves from the world. Let's be holy and white. Let's be willing. Let's watch the boundaries. And let's wash. Not just throughly, but thoroughly. Outward as well as inward. I want you to be ready. Are you? What if he came tonight? Say, well, I, okay, you got one or two things right. What about getting on to it and getting a couple more right? And like John Kovic's bumper sticker says, let's get right for the flight. You're about out of here. This age is almost over. Make sure you're ready. Be all so ready, for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. You're going to have to examine yourself. I just preached the book. You got those areas covered? I hope you do. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful now for the Word of God. Lord, perhaps there's some convictions needed. Probably is. God, that you'd work in a very definite way. May the Holy Ghost of God sanctify what has been said. 
and God that you'd make stick what needs to stick Lord I pray that one day soon you come back I pray that this message and the response to it will prove to have been a plus